Today we are in the second section of Hebrews chapter 12, which talks to us about the loving discipline of God in our lives. Now, we've mentioned many times in this series that this book is written to a group of people that are struggling in every way. They're beaten down, they're marginalized, they're challenged, they're suffering in many ways, and they're trying their best to try to understand the goodness of God in the context that all around them seems like everything is against them. And at the best, they're trying to understand and press into the goodness of God. And at their worst, they're just trying to hold on to a sliver of faith in who God is and what God wants for them. So as we read through this book, it almost reads like a giant sermon. And so the first two-thirds of the book set out truth about God. And this last third really gets into the exhortation part of the sermon where he's pressing them to lean into the truth. That that truth isn't just information, but actually affects their lives in their hearts. So he's pressing them, and he's comforting them, and he's challenging them all at the same time. And as we move into this part of chapter 12, we see the author move from encouragement, especially back in chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12, into what we would call full exhortation. A sort of like, come on then, old chap, you can do it, play the man. I had a spiritual director once who was an old British bishop. That's literally how he spoke to me. He was very kind. But this is what I hear when I read this book of Hebrews. I hear this encouragement. Come on, Jesse, play the man. It's okay. (laughs) That's what's happening here in this chapter. And it speaks to the broader question. It speaks to how can we live into the fullness of life that God calls us to live in a world that's filled with discomfort and suffering. And when things don't go like they sound in some of the worship songs, like, Lord, you're going to make my life great and filled with hope and joy. And he does. But what does that look like? in our actual lives in the context that we live in. So these are the questions that this audience was asking, and I think we can lean in together with this audience and ask these same questions. How do we, how do we experience the goodness of God in the land of the living? How do we endure and walk through troubles and hardships? How do we hold on to a deep and life-changing faith in spite of everything that we see around us? And one answer, which we'll see in part, at least part of the answer, as we'll see this week, is rather than spurn and push away the discipline of God in our lives, we actually embrace it. We actually embrace the discipline of God in our lives because we see it as the movement of a loving God to shape us and to form us into the very image of Jesus Christ. John Owen put it this way. He said, everything is necessary that he sends. Nothing is necessary that he withholds. Everything is necessary that he sends. Nothing is necessary that he withholds. So let's look here in Hebrews chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, you can go to verse 5. There's red Bibles in front of you in the pews if you'd like to look at that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Um, Before we jump into what the apostle talks to us about the discipline of God in our lives... I want to make sure that this idea of the discipline of God in our lives, which sounds uncomfortable, isn't hanging in midair, isn't isolated from what we read last week. And so I want to make sure to remind us what we read last week, that a big part, maybe the biggest part of our lives and really in the world of any sort of discomfort and pain and suffering that we see around us emerges from the reality that the whole world from the beginning of time, after the fall, is affected by sin. So last week, we heard the author embrace that truth when he called life a race. He said, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And the word that he uses in Greek is the word agon, which is agonia. And we likened it to like a tough mudder race followed by a UFC fight. If you have to go back to the sermon to understand that image. But what he's talking about is that life is an enduring hard race. It's literally an agonia. And the reason for that is because sin affects all things in the world. So in verse 3 it says, Consider him who endured, and the key words there are, he who endured from sinners. Consider him who endured from sinners. What sin did is it, what sin did is it took the good creation of God, us being the crown of creation, And it separates us from the fullness of God's life-giving presence. So that what was created to flourish and to reflect God's beauty became corrupted. Disease and death and conflict is present in the world because of that. 
And we know that God responded, we see in verse 3, he responded by actually entering into the suffering and pain. And the last week we said that he calls us to throw off all the sin that entangles us. We read that Jesus actually entered into the world and entangled himself with our sin for our sake so that we could be free from the sin that affects all the world. This is the good grace of God, that God hates sin, that God hates the effect of sin on the world, that he hates disease and pain and suffering. And I just learned this the other day that, you know, when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, there's that famous shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, those two words. But the, some of the tone that's present there in the original language and some commentators would say is that Jesus was angry, not angry at the people, not angry at Lazarus, but angry at death. Angry at the effect of sin in the world. So suffering and pain and difficulty and discomfort that comes from the agony of life and the agony of life comes from the fall of sin that affects the whole world. And God didn't leave us alone to deal with that, but he actually entered in fully to that. So we need to hold that firmly in our minds as we think about God's discipline because we understand that sin is a big part of our discomfort and our pain. And for more on that, we would love to talk to you. But we hold that in one hand. And in the other hand, we see actually that also, as we walk through the courses of our lives, that God does bring loving discipline into our lives from time to time. So we're going to look at why does he do that? What is he trying to do as he does that? And what does that mean for us? So starting here in verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises or reproves every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Now notice the brackets in verse 5 and at the end of verse 7. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons and daughters? God is treating you as sons and daughters. This is the brackets of what he's talking about with discipline. In other words, what he's saying is, you are mine. (laughs) I love you. You're no longer slaves. You're no longer slaves to fear or your own desires or the desires of your flesh. You're actually a child of mine that I count as my own. You're a member of my family. You've been adopted in. You're part of my family. And as part of being a part of my family, I want to train you into how this family lives. Now, many of you know that I got to live in Cambodia for several years, and several of my friends worked for an organization called International Justice Mission, IJM for short. And they became famous in 2003, I think, they, where they actually went into a place that had uh, children that were in slavery, essentially, and they raided the place. It was in Phnom Penh, actually, where, not, I mean, far from where I live, but in the city where we live. And they raided and they rescued these children from this terrible existence that they had. And that sort of catapulted them to become, to help them become famous. And so they went throughout the world, and they're in India and Africa and all around the world, And they do this amazing work of bringing freedom through justice systems and through leveraging the tools of the world to bring freedom into the lives of people. And it's really amazing. And I remember talking to one of my friends who worked for a long time with IJM, and he mentioned that uh, it's a huge and amazing joy to see rescue happen in the lives of these people, people who were literally slaves that have been set free. And then he said, Jesse, but the actual work, so that's really hard to actually rescue them, but the actual work is not just rescuing them physically from the bondage that they're in, but the actual work is to get them to embrace a new identity as people who are no longer enslaved. He said so often when people are rescued that they end up stealing food from the people that are caring for them. And they end up being almost violent towards the people that that are caring for them. And the people that are caring for them say, what's the deal? We just rescued you. And the reality is is that they have in their lives been embedded so deeply with this, this scourge of bondage. This idea that they won't have food tomorrow. This idea that if they don't fight back and protect themselves, that they will be taken advantage of and violence will be done to them. And so the vestiges and the remnants of this life of slavery is present in their lives for a long time. In fact, it's a lifelong process to see that identity 
change. And so they, they would say, even after years, sometimes they would steal food just out of a habit. They would just see food and put it in their pocket because they're so used to being hungry. And so many other challenges that they had to deal with. So the hardest part of the work wasn't just the rescue, but it was actually getting them to embrace this new identity that they were actually free to remove from them the vestiges of their slavery. You know, the world and the nature of our flesh trains us oftentimes to live in the same way, to live with a scarcity mindset, this idea that we have to grasp and sort of put things in our pockets and save things for ourselves and make sure that we control our lives. That's a scarcity mindset, not the mindset of somebody who lives in the household of a benevolent, benevolent loving father who promises to provide for them. People, the nature of God's discipline is in part a way to remove the vestiges of the bondage of sin that's affected all of us and all of our flesh. To remove this mindset of slavery and to help us to embrace this new identity as sons and daughters of a loving, generous king. So Romans 8.29, for instance, says, tells us that God's plan for us is that we are to be conformed into the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn of many brothers. So what that's saying is that we are, in one sense, the very brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, that he is the firstborn, he goes before us, but this model of who Jesus is is the actual image of who God wants to transform us into. Not people who have the vestiges of slavery and sin and scarcity and sort of react out when somebody gets close to us, but people who look exactly like Jesus Christ. So this is the goal of God's discipline in our lives, that while uncomfortable for periods of time, while we don't want to run to it and look for it, the goal is that the vestiges of slavery and bondage are removed from us and that we embrace further and further the identity of who we are as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. So for the same reason that I might say to my children, no, you cannot have donuts every meal of the day. Or, yes, you have to practice math again until it's embedded more in your mind. And in this house, we share because in this house, we are generous people. Now, the same reason I say those things, it's out of love. It's out of wanting to form the character and the nature of our children to be more like who Jesus is. The same way that God works in our lives. The goal of God's discipline is to form us into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, to make this more practical, as someone who's been on the receiving end of much discipline in my life from parents and teachers and police officers and other people, there are two types of disciplines that we find in these verses. And I'll just sort of categorize it pretty generally. One is what you'd call corrective discipline. So it uses that word reprove or chastise in some translations. It's uh, the same root word that we get scourge even in the English language. But corrective discipline is the kind of discipline that corrects something in our character so that we're formed. So, for instance, when I was 19 years old, I liked to drive really fast. I really didn't care about speed limits, and I had control of the car. And I remember one police officer saying, you're passing everything in sight. That's why I pulled you over. Anyways, so there... So I like to drive fast, and more than a few police officers and the system of points and fines and court system provided a, what's called a corrective discipline in my life to form me into becoming a safer driver. Now I'm a dad, I'm a much safer driver. But there's this corrective discipline that God applies in our lives, so God may correct us from time to time. So he may allow us to suffer the consequences of sin that we're walking in. It may allow us to suffer the consequences of greed or selfishness in the form of a hurt relationship or financial stress. He may allow us to walk through that. Or God may grieve our spirit internally where we're literally lacking a sense of peace, where there's a restlessness and emptiness that comes up in our lives despite trying to fill ourselves with everything the world offers, where God allows that spirit to rest on us to show us that there's no satisfaction deeply eternally in the world around us. God may allow suffering in our lives to wake us up, to lull us out of a life of comfort where all we care about is being comfortable and relaxed. C.S. Lewis famously said that suffering is God's megaphone to rouse a sleeping world. 
So God may douse us with cold water to wake us up as we walk through life and say, there's deeper things that I want you to pay attention to in your lives. Sometimes God may shout at us figuratively, the same way I might be more harsh to my children momentarily if they run out into the street or as my daughter runs to me carrying a hypodermic needle in a park. True story. (laughs) Put it down now! Dad, you scared me. I'm so sorry, but I didn't want you to fall on a hypodermic needle. Sometimes God may shout at us. Sometimes God may shout at us if we're moving into the danger of addiction or walking down the path that may damage our faith for the rest of our lives. God corrects those he loves. He does it out of love with a desire to form us. God's discipline is because we are his sons and daughters. So there's corrective discipline. There's also what I would categorize as preemptive discipline. For that, if you see in verse 11, he says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, we're trained is what he's using is referring to preemptive discipline. It's, it's the word gymnazo, where we get the word gymnasium or gymna- gymnasio. It's literally like physical training. And so God may allow hardships to come into our lives just in the way we get hardships to our muscles to build our muscles. Or we might provide hardship temporarily to our lungs to train our lungs and to build our capacity. God does this preemptively to build us up into the kind of people he wants us to be. And so someone might go from, you know, never engaging with God to praying for a little bit and, and maybe after one week say, you know, I've never had this deep experience with God. And God may say, actually, I want you to press into this prayer for longer. I'm building you and I'm forming you more into the person that I want you to be. Sometimes this takes the form of God calling us to deny ourselves and to pick up our crosses and follow him and to engage voluntarily in things like prayer and fasting for more hours or to be generous with our money that is hard to part with rather than use it for momentary gratification or to hold us to hard truths, have us hold those hard truths when we're in public, even if they might be socially or even financially costly for us to do so. God calls us into a life where he trains us to form us. Now, spoiler alert, they always say preacher announcements, spoiler alert, this spring we're going to be reading a book called The Way of Christ, And the subtitle is A Modern Interpretation of the Benedictine Rule of Life for People with Families and Jobs. And what he does in the first two-thirds of the book is sort of do a modern interpretation of the rule of St. Benedict. And the last third of the book, he says, well, that's the high bar. Let's talk about a bar for all of our lives. And one of the things we're going to do as a congregation, or at least all are encouraged to do, is read this book and to think about ways in which God is inviting us into a season of more gymnasio in our lives. And the invitation is not about being holier than other people, or being righteous, or being more Anglican, or or being more churchy, or even being more Christian. The goal is that we enter into a form of temporary, at least what seems to us, hardship, training, so that we're formed more and more to the likeness of Christ, that his values pervade our minds and our souls, that we train ourselves away from the flesh and more into the life of the spirit that God calls us into. Now, Basil the Great said this, In truth, tribulations are for those well-prepared, like certain foods and exercises are for athletes, which lead the contestant on to the hereditary glory. I love that word, hereditary This glory that we have hereditary inherited as being sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, of of God the Father, invited into fellowship together with the Trinity. God disciplines us to form us. Sometimes it's corrective. Sometimes it's preemptive, gymnasio. And the goal is to increase our capacity for virtue, to grow our faith, and to move us towards maturity in him. Now, the question for us, of course, just as we start to wrap up here, the question for us, of course, is how will we respond? How do we respond to God's training, his discipline, his corrective and his preemptive discipline in our lives? How are we going to respond? 
Now, it's interesting that word discipline that's used multiple times here in this passage comes from the Greek word paideia, from whence we get the word pedagogy for training and pediatrics for uh, like a pediatrician. And it reminds me of a time long, long, long ago when I was considering different careers and I helped out in a medical clinic for a while and I was working in the office of a pediatrician. And we had this one little girl and I, was, I got to be the translator so I was just sort of going back and forth. And we had this one little girl that came in. She was probably about five years old. And for the life of her, she would not open her mouth. She would grit her teeth like, ah, ah. And the doctor would say, okay, open your mouth. And I'd say, abre la, abre la boca. And she would just, ah. And, and she would sort of give us a face like, just try it, I dare you. Get anything near me and I will bite your finger off. Now this pediatrician wanted to apply a momentary discomfort in this girl's life in order to bring healing into her life. That's really what the goal of the pediatrician was. But her response was like, go ahead and try. See if you can do that. Now, we can often have the same response to God when he comes to move and to heal us and to form us. When he steps into our lives and he applies a little discomfort or invites us to voluntarily embrace a little discomfort in our lives for the purpose of removing the vestiges of our former bondage, we can often react like this little girl in the pediatrician's office. Like, no, I'm not going to do it no matter how much you tell me. As we, read in our, as we read our last verses today, it's almost like the apostle calls us and he's calling out all the different ways that we might respond to God's discipline in our lives. So one way we might just resist strongly. And, and as we read these last verses, I'll go through them very quickly, but these are the different ways that we can respond. And these are the ways that he's calling us that we should respond. So verse 12, he says this, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Now, one of the ways that we react to hardship, whether it's outside hardship or the discipline that God has in our lives, is like that little kid, you know, when you tell them to get out of the car, and they know you're stronger than them, so they do, they do this dead body routine. And they just literally make you drag them out of the car into the house. So he's saying, strengthen the weak knees. Be put back into joint. Lift up the drooping hands. Don't go completely limp. We can often do that in our own lives, spiritually, spiritually where we tune out, where we code out spiritually to God, we stop engaging altogether. We literally go limp body, spiritually speaking. Now this, of course, is an understandable way to cope, but the encouragement here is to lift up the drooping hands, strengthen the weak knees. Do not spurn the discipline of God in our lives. Embrace it because it's for our good. Verse 13, he says, Make straight the paths for your feet. And one of the ways we respond to the discipline of God is that we engage in distraction. And so we might go to the left or to the right, or we make our paths as curvy as possible so that we aren't faced with this, what we consider the specter of God calling us down the path that he has for us. So we fill our lives with endless distraction. Scripture here says, make straight the paths. Make the way for God open and straight in your lives. Verse 14, strive for peace with everything. This is what I like to call the activist response. The opposite to that is like this little girl in the doctor's office. We just sort of get mad at the pain in our lives or the discipline that might be coming into our lives. And so we contend and we fight. We might push back against God or we might look for someone else to blame. Of course, there can be an injustice to root out in our lives, but this response makes like this activism and contention the way of life. And this verse says opposite to that, when God's discipline comes into your life, Strive for peace with all those around you. Look for peace, not for winning. Accept the discipline of God. And lastly, in verse 15 and 16, he says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And this is the gravest response that we often have is to be like Esau. If you remember the story of Esau, Esau came in from the fields and he had his inheritance because he was the firstborn son and he was so hungry and he was looking so much for momentary comfort in his life that he traded his whole inheritance for a single meal. If you read back in the scriptures, another word for traded his inheritance, it says that he despised his inheritance. So everything that was given to him, he despised, and he traded it for momentary comfort. 
Now, this is the temptation that we all face, especially when we embrace times of hardship, to take this inheritance that we have that's promised future hope as the children of God and be willing to trade it for something that's more immediate, more comforting, easier, where we can actually despise the inheritance that we've been given. The encouragement here is don't despise. Don't be like Esau. Embrace your inheritance. Do not spurn the discipline of the Lord. God calls us his sons and his daughters. He loves us. He forms us. He is with us. So let us together as his family embrace his formation in our lives. Let's run together with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again for your grace in our lives. We ask that you would give us hearts to receive the challenges that you sometimes allow to come into our lives. You would help us to grow by them and be formed by them. Lord, let us see you as the loving Father who provides us with everything that we need. Let us embrace the path that you have for our lives. Build us up in this church, we pray. We lift all of this time to your great and holy name. Amen.